So, we're back again with Mauricio Alonso. Um, Bellator 172 is in the books. You had a fight with Josh Koscheck. How did it go? Go nice. Went nice. So, I won by knockout in the first round at four minutes and something. Uh, I was pretty happy with my performance. I perform the way I can perform. I perform the way I train. And I could be unleashed there. I could be without any change, without any hesitation. And I perform beautifully. First round knockout of a legend like Josh Koscheck. I mean, on the main card, Spike TV, Bellator. We talked about this, I think, before, way before it was even announced that the fight was taking place. We actually had to hold back the original interview a yes. little bit just to make sure everything's good, to make sure the announcement goes through, so uh, to make sure we're not leaking information at the time. So we had to actually slow it down. We had the, a little bit of a forward notice. So, yep. But now... Fight's over. Fight's over. <laughs> In the books. Um, man, first round knockout is a huge deal. It, it seemed like your jab, your reach was really a deciding factor. And uh, he never was able to actually find a, a range, find any comfort. And it looks like some of the, the early jabs actually hurt him quite a bit. He connected with a, a few rights as well. Like, uh, talk me through sort of, uh, you know, how how you were kind of feeling in that initial uh, exchange, the, the first few exchanges with Josh. So a fighter like Josh Koshak is a guy that is pretty dangerous, have a good wrestling, excellent wrestler. Not all guys are four times national champions in wrestling. He oh. is. So his wrestling background is something really impressive. Uh, his hands, he have a really strong right hand, some left hooks that cut, caught people before really well. And But in the end of the day, I was his pattern didn't change too much, right? Heavy hands, respect, but his pattern, the way he throws it, the way he fight it, didn't change too much. So I picture that on my trainings. I have my training partners, my training partners, special man, James Terry. That guy, thank you, James, for all trainings that we did together. He's a great wrestler, and his biotype is pretty similar to, to, to Josh. And training with him a lot this last camp helped me a lot to picture Josh Koshak really in front of me. And I could see everything well. My vision was, was really focused, and I could picture his movements really well. And that was the game plan that we did with Coach Kieran. Uh, establish your jab, keep your reach, walk away for his right hand circle to the right side. Sometimes I went to his right hand for that side, but I move well and on my reach. Um, also, my jiu-jitsu was pretty sharp. I've been training with Carlos Sapão, and that helps me a lot. Also, to feel free to use my strikings re re without any, any hesitation to go to the ground because I knew my jiu-jitsu was pretty sharp and the way we were training was pretty pretty good. And that helps me to unleash my striking more comfortable. So I was really comfortable for him. Okay, he take me down, take me down. Let's swim with the shark now, you know? And the strategy was followed. So when people said, oh, he's done, he's this and that, he's that. Man, the guy is a great fighter. When we lock ourselves there and he came through, he came hungry. And if you realize, the first action that I had on the fight was kicking him on the face. Right when, when he cornered me on the cage, I threw two high kicks on him to slow down that, that intensity of him. So he, that was part of the game plan. Free kicks, high free kicks, because I'm tall, the kicks would hit him like a jab. And then I establish my jab. And when I establish my jab, I start to my, my my inside leg kicks that are pretty quick. Jab, leg kick, leg kick, jab, cross. So he was kind of, he didn't know what was coming. One right hand that he threw me early on the fight, he hit me kind of on the back of the head that I felt. Oh, I felt a flash, his strong hands. But I fired back right away and caught him in a two, two punches on the, on the counter that he felt. 
And then after he threw me one, two, and I fired back like six. And all them get in. So uh, I was pretty well trained for this fight, you know. I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that. So have you had a chance to watch the fight back uh, since on the YouTube video or on the Bellator website or anything? Yes, I watched the fight. I watched to see, of course, when you fight, you have a, a, an ocean about how you did and what you did, how that happens. I was actually, like I told you, picturing pretty clear the strategy was followed perfect. The game plan was followed on point. But when I watch the fight, of course, I have some moments on the fight that I, uh, you found some mistakes on yourself, always, even when you win. But the, well, as I told, is the one of the first times after a fight that I'm really happy with my performance. And I'm somebody that I charge myself a lot in that. I never satisfied. Even if I win a fight, I'm never satisfied. I think I fought bad. Ah, but you won. But I won, but I didn't convince. So this time I convinced it. This time was was a nice performance. Yeah, they, they say is, is a, is a, if you're a black belt in jiu-jitsu with as much experience as you have, you're never going to be quite, you know, accepting or quite satisfied. You're always going to be striving for like, oh, but this one thing went wrong. Ah, but I could have done this a little bit better. Like we're very self-deprecating. You know, yes, we're always yeah, looking yeah. to improve. The one thing I noticed above everything, watching the fight, you know, and watching it back again, is like you were almost like crazy how calm you were like you were very relaxed in this fight almost you had this level of certainty like, going into the fight I mean where where was where was your mind in terms of nerves I know we talked and you seem very almost like the stars were aligned like this fight was the right thing like this everything happens and this is like a blessing type thing but when you went into the fight how, how where were you mentally emotionally where were your nerves because watching you you know at least back on the video and the live you seem very calm i was calm man i was calm that calmness was not only on that on the fight but came from my training camp came in from a conscious that I was doing everything I should and everything I could to be there prepared and ready to do it. Like, I always fight 185. That is the first time that I fight 170 and works well. I try other four times, two fight, two times I got hurt before and two times the fight didn't went, went well. But this time, by that experience that I had before, I knew what kind of mistakes I made before on my weight cutting, on my strength conditioning, training to make 170 strong. So I was feeling pretty strong. I was feeling pretty fast. My cardio was insane. I went to do my, my, my medicals and on rest, my heart beats was 45, 46. Wow. And then you, okay, give 100 hops. Then you go 100 hops, sit down again, 55. So my cardio condition was pretty well. So I finished the fight, I was fresh, I was clean, and I could go another one right that night. You know, so every, all that, that, that combinations of the people on your side, Coach Kirian, Sapão, the way the train happens, the instructions that they gave me, the confidence that they passed to me, what is really important. And it's not only one factor, like I said, all these factors together make that calmness happen. You know, when I was pretty calm, I was surprised with myself. You know, even yeah, the, your level of composure, just watching it back and watch, just watching you process and adjust. And, uh, it felt like you could even see your confidence build very, very quickly after you connected with the first one or two shots, and you could see you moved them back. If you saw Josh's head kind of snap yes. back when you saw how, you know how long your your jab was, uh, the the reach. Uh, he was he was pressing forward. He was walking forward, but I like to work as a counter, also, and that was. Part of my strategy, when I when I start to fight, I was on my mind, I'm gonna make him miss. He gonna throw this right over hands, he gonna miss all them. He hit me, I think, two punches on the fight. One right hand and two right hands. 
that's it. He hit me twice on the fight. And I touch him often, kicks and jabs and straights. And when I finished that uppercut, it was, was something that I was feeling in my training camp. Because as he's arrested, I knew when he get in trouble, his first reaction is shoot or change his level to shoot at least. And all my training sessions looks like crazy. I was kind of thinking about it that too much and I was picturing that momentum. Every training session, I finished my training sessions and I went to the uppercut bag and I start maybe five or 10 minutes, only timing, jab, uppercut, hook, uppercut. Jab, jab, uppercut, straight uppercut, two uppercuts in a row. I was with that with that punch specific on the mind. And on the locker room, I was warming up with Coach Kirian, and we were talking about it. And he said, oh, when you listen to me, this, you have to do this, to give me his instructions. And I said, but I'm feeling the uppercut, sir. Can I throw it? If you throw it, throw the uppercut, throw it. So when I heard him with the right hand, and... I didn't rush because I knew he was done there. That right hand was fast and was super strong, man. Super strong. When you watch, don't look too strong, but uh, rock him badly, you know? And when he walked back and I went forward, I, I knew I could not run through him or desperate or rush to take him out because he was already out. If I rush, only thing could happen was he countered me with some stuff or grab me and hack over and survive the round. So I was really methodical. And then I approached him, kick, and then he tried to push me off of him. He didn't even punch, he pushed me off. And then I back, and then I saw an uppercut time. I, I faked the hook, and he was this, and he lifted his hand. And I see that very clear. And when I threw the uppercut, I knew it was there. It was not an accident. That was not, oh, it just happened. No, it was, it was everything pictured. On the trainings and everything pictured on the moment. Was, I knew what I was doing. I knew when I crossed the cage hunting him, he was hurt. And he was hurt bad. And I know for Take your time, stay composure, stay in the pocket, and throw to kill. That's it, what I did. I kept your composure really well, and yeah. it was a good stoppage. Um, good stoppage. He was hurt. The referee got in very, he got in prompt. Um, he was already hurt. He was very hurt. It looked like he tried to get up, but again, like you see, when your body goes limp like that, it was, it was a good stoppage. He's, he's out there to protect the athlete, so it was, it was, it was good. So he connected with a solid shot, and he crumbled. Yes, um, he, he, he was. You could see it very clearly. I mean, his your body goes limp, and it, it was a very good stoppage, man. Yeah, I felt good. I felt good on seventy. I was. I think I'm gonna. I go to stick with this division now. One hundred and seventy pounds. I was. How was, uh, the, how was the cut for you? You you're... was the. I actually, I I knew about the fight seven weeks before. They called me seven weeks before. And I was 210 pounds back then. Yeah. We, we talked about this on New Year's. Yes. Year. This is, you, had, uh, you had just found out a few days earlier on New exactly. Year's. Exactly. Yeah, and it, you, you slimmed down quite a bit when I saw you then. Yes, and then what I, what I did was the first three weeks, I actually lost a lot of weight. Of course, I was 210, but I was fat. I was not in shape with 210. It's Christmas, you have yes. you know, yes. you know, you're yes. town, you Yes, my know. son were here it's from Brazil. Happy. We were hanging out. You know, I was eating everything that I want. But when they called me and, and they said, oh, Jane called me and said, oh, I have a fight for you. It was 70. I said, oh, we could do like a catch weight or something. Then she told me, no, it's a TV fight. You have to be out of work. So when she told me it's a TV fight, I answer her back right away. If I don't know who that is, I mean, I don't want to know who against. I'm, I mean, you know. So then, after a few days, she talked with Kirian and Michael Bruno. They are the two guys that helped me forever. And then they really told me, "Oh, it's a Josh Koscheck, a free pot. Beautiful. Let's do it." You know. Yeah. Still, just uh, sounds very surreal, man. Like came and went already. 
Yeah. So what's uh, what's your deal like with Bellator? I mean, without specifics, I mean, are you planning to fight again with this promotion? Are you looking for fights in other organizations? Man, Is there anything on the table right now? I, I really need looking forward to fight at Bellator because Bellator is a great organization and it's growing a lot. They treat the athletes pretty well. The respect that they have with their fighters, undercard and main card. I fought on the prelims before. Oh, they treat me really well. Uh, and I think the exposure on TV around the world, they have the TV, the TV already, Spike TV. In Brazil, I was streaming on Fox Live. My whole, my, my whole family and friends in Brazil, my son was watching live. It was a big emotion for me to watch and for he watch me and perform that way. And he could send a message decently for everybody you know that was very important for me that's amazing i know they have a spike uk i know there's spike tv all this stuff's available online for streaming so people can go back and see it again i mean they have a lot of fights in these events i mean you know ufc i don't know if they do this as well but there's prelim and post limb so yeah i guess if the main card doesn't go that long there's fights you know the undercard fights will go even after the main event. exactly that happened with me when i fought before on bellator I, my fight was right after Tito Ortiz's fight. Tito Ortiz and Liam McGarry. I fight right after the main event. You know, and it was the first time I fought there. And I really want to stick with Bellator and I hope they call me soon to, to work again. Um, as a 37 years old, I'm turning next Monday. As a 37 years old fighter, I really wish don't wait too much to be there on the cage again. And I'm having a feeling that I will be there pretty, pretty soon. Yeah, man, I, I think you're like the new Mystic Mac. I and mean, when you make the prediction now, I'm like, I think I'm going to have you pick my lottery numbers now. <laughs> so it, it worked out pretty yes, well man. last time. I'll, I don't so I don't, I don't like to talk about fights. A lot of guys, they have this their, their style, man. I have to respect. I'm going to beat the crap of this guy. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to kill this guy. I'm going to murder him. I'm going to kick him. I, man. Because in the end of the day, when you get locked in a cage, everything that you talked before doesn't matter. Your words don't go there. Your thoughts go there. Your, your actions before the fight are with you inside the cage. And that's what, what really matters. What is the saying? Like, everybody has plans so they get punched in the face. Exactly. <laughs> and then the plan's out the window, then you're going to do what you want. Uh, and I, I, it was a blessed night. Uh, and regardless, that night, win or lose, I was already really happy to be living that moment. You know, of course, with the victory and the way it happens, uh, was a very special night. And so this is your just about five year anniversary to coming to the United States and joining up with this academy. You've got yeah. the right ingredients now, it seems like, to move forward. you got a great camp. You, you have the weight dialed in, figured out. Yeah, exactly. And you just took out, not just a legend, but a guy that was arguably number one, number two contender in the welterweight division in the UFC for years. Yes. For years. This guy fought GSP on pay-per-view. And, and also the people said, oh, he's done, he's this, he's that. Man, the haters, the, 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 the keyboard rev revolutionaries now. <laughs> oh man! They don't understand this 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 game. He come from five losses. Okay, he was not on, on his best. How can I say, on his best run? No. But man, if you look for who this guy lost, he lost for three former champ, two former champions, and a champion. He lost to Robbie Lawler, Jim Han Jane, uh, Johnny Hendricks, Tyron Woodley. Jake Ellenberger, that is a fucking monster. And Eric Silva, that is another top contender. So he just lost for really, really, really tough guys. Best top contenders, champions and former champions. So the people need to understand about study better, do your homework better to judge a fighter. Oh, he's done or he's not done. Does that mean that you lost some fights and you are done? There should be a requirement before they can talk about somebody so 
until they've been punched in the back of the head by Josh Koscheck, they shouldn't be able to talk. Exactly. Well, that guy, man, he rocked me with a right hand early in the fight. I see everything black, and I come back. I fire back. But uh, he hit me strong, man. He have a very, very, I have to be, I had to be really smart, man. One of his right hand, well done on your face, you're done. I would be knocked down. So, I mean, when you talk about Josh Koscheck's record, win or loss, every single person in his last dozen fights have been some of the, literally the best welterweights in the world. Well, he beat ever. Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson is fighting for the title, man. He beat the shit out of Anthony Johnson. He tapped him. At two or he, five. At, yeah. He, he uh, get a, he won Matt, he beat Matt Hughes, Paul Daly, jo Frank Trigg. He beat legends, man. This guy has a background on MMA. So huge, so that I don't care. Nobody gonna take the, the favor of a victory against an MMA legend. That's why the truth. Because Koscheck was that he he was iconic, man. He was he was like uh, what's his name, uh, Chael Sonnen before Chael Sonnen, man. He was exactly. like the original bad boy in MMA. Yeah, he had, remember? like he starts with that trash talk, that kind of attitude, very cocky and very arrogant and very very. Uh, polemic, you know, with his with his his words. Oh yeah, he was like Tito Ortiz plus. Exactly. So man, I'm so happy and I'm so so ready to move forward and, and go back on that cage again, my friend. So out here right now, we're we're over at KOA your academy here and. Newark, California, and I know there was a, a big uh, ovation. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, your, your, your teammates, your students came out to see you fight. I think from here, 150, 160 people were there watching live. Students, kids, everybody. And you got the space to do it. You might kind of point the that away real quick. Just want to kind of give people an idea here. So these are some of the, the young warriors here. A KOA. Hey guys, give a shout out for the camera here. <laughs> Line up again, guys. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Mauricio's got some young warriors over here that all came out in force and numbers, 150 strong. This is a big academy. It's yeah. a really nice place. And the, and the thing is, man. Uh, a lot of people came to me after the fight when I was on the on SAP and even on comments and social media about my speech after of the fight, right? Even you when you come here. So that really came from my heart, man. I think it came from, from God. Because look at these kids here. The word should be like these kids I have. Muslim kids, Hindu kids, Christian kids, kids maybe don't heard about God from their parents, about religion in general. I'm a Christian and work with and for Muslims and you know what? The world should be like them. They don't dislike each other because any beliefs, they don't dislike each other because of that. They are pure, they are innocent. And then the evil man come to them and plant some evil seed about segregation between religions. And that's so sad because it's no good, man. And that was the message that, that I would like to, to send for the world, that God was touching my heart to send for the world. That message was most important for me in my victory because a lot of people came to me and, con and congratulate me more sometimes by the speech from then from the victory because a victory can happen or not a message like that on the world the way it is now for me was such important and really if if that message touched people's hearts my job was was done perfectly oh, absolutely it, it took a, like a lot of courage and it's very selfless to do this instead of going out and talking about some promotion or some sponsor or the party after the fight or thanking this whatever uh, or talking i'm gonna fight for the title you go out and you put out a, a message of love and peace and stopping the war stopping the fighting stopping you know worrying about these small differences that they they want you to worry about yes <laughs> and the thing is you know the kids can change this world, you know, those kids, this generation. Not only here in the United States, but all around the world. 
I watched a movie one time that was pretty, pretty uh, uh, interesting for me. It was about a, a dog, a, a German Shepherd, white German Shepherd, that was a racist dog. And a, a black, a black guy trainer found the dog, and the dog was the, them want to kill him, right? And then he tried to understand the dog and, uh, and what happened. That specific dog really didn't like a black people, right? And then he started to look for the background of the dog, and he found the first owner of the dog. The dog was a white racist man. And what he did was only him feed the dog, and only him pet the dog, and he paid like black people to go there and hit and smash the shit out of the dog. So the dog was conditioned to hate that specific profile of person. Kids are like dogs. You condition them to hate and you condition them to love. Their brain are like a sponge. Everything, every information that you send, the brain gonna process. And they gonna understand that. And they don't gonna filter that because they don't have knowledge enough and maturity enough to filter stupid information. So that movie, when I remember, when I was like the age of these kids when I watched it, 12, 13, 14 years old. And that movie, for some reason, marked my, my life. I never forgot about that movie. And today I work with kids. And the word that it is, is, is really clear. People are doctrinated, people are conditioned to hate to segregate they, they are not conditioned to unify that is the the most clear thing that I learned with, with working with these kids they are pure they are innocent they don't hate each other for all these stupid reasons of course sometimes he disagree with all the kids ah he did this did that but it's not no beliefs involved no religion no segregation Kids. Oh man, on, on the mat, we're all the same color. We're like, you have a white beard, a blue beard. But I mean, we're all the same in here. And this is the one place in the world where the, the, this, this election politics, the, the red and blue or black and white, none, none of this stuff matters at all. Everybody yeah. just comes to change. The world needs more things like this. Exactly. Uh, I'm glad I could send this, this message in a, in a platform like that for a whole world. I think that message, that one of the reasons that I believe now we, took too long for I have this kind of exposure was for I be mature enough to do what I did, to behave the way I did in the whole process, not only on the, the way I thought, but my posture after, and that's a reminder of my father. My father was a man that always worried about his integrity. So when I was talking there, I was worried and I was focusing on people look a man with integrity there. Not a clown, but not someone that would say what everybody say. Maybe say something nobody have heart or courage to say in these times. And that was God's message for, for who would Usually me to send this message. I'm really glad. Yeah, it, it took 20 professional fights, the correct training. 20 the... years and 20 professional fights. Look at that. In February 17. <laughs> to, to get a microphone in your hand, man, you, you definitely earned it. Yeah. And you, I, I can't think of a better, more responsible, and more like a loving way to take this energy you put into it and share it with the world. Man. Exactly. So you got everyone's attention with the knockout, and then one more minute, you made a, a very convincing speech. And then um, I think you only changed one person's life. You did. Exactly. And you have millions of people watching this thing across the world. They're going to be watching this. Anybody that even looks at your career, Josh Koscheck or the Bellator, they're going to see this. They're going to see the record. They're going to cook. They're going to see the fight. Yes. And then at the end, they're going to hear this. So exactly. Forever. It's, it's an amazing thing, man. Um, I think uh, that's some big kids. Yeah, these guys are you know waiting for you, man. So I gotta get some training on my own end, man. my brother. It's a pleasure to follow you on this journey. My, my pleasure to be here again. Thank you again. Oh yeah. God bless you guys. Follow this guy. This show is so nice. Always very interesting people and interesting interviews. Thank you so much for the space. 
God bless you guys and let's get ready for the next. Pleasure's mine, man. Mauricio Alonso, 2017. And then the year just getting started, guys. Yes. God bless. Thank you. Oh.